Thank you guys for coming to our presentation on digital yeah. technology in the classroom. So I guess to start off, we'll just introduce ourselves. We're a group of teacher candidates in our first year. Um, we are in the intermediate division in the global cohort. I'm Dean, I'm at my teachable music. I'm Megan, and my teachable science. I'm Jesse, my teachable is math. I'm Angie, my teachable is French. Hi, I'm Erica, and my teachable is history. And I'm Genevieve, and my teachable is science. So we want you to uh, fill in the blanks for the sentence. So students depend on blank too much. They don't know how to blank. A lot of good points here. So students depend on calculators too much. They don't know how to do math in their head. Students depend on t textbooks and teachers too much. They don't know how to learn independently. Depend on adults do things on their own. Same vein. Potato <laughs> smash. <laughs> <laughs> and the point of this activity here is sort of to highlight that this debate isn't new. The original quote is that students depend on paper too much. <laughs> they don't know how to write on slate without getting chalk dust all over themselves. They can't clean a slate properly. What will they do when they run out of paper? And the best part, this was said by a school principal in 1815. <laughs> so what this sort of brings to light is that technology in the classroom has sort of been a discussion since the beginning of the public schooling system. Um, in our presentation today, as you saw earlier, we're going to be specifically talking about digital technology. Uh, and we're going to be talking about some of the pros, such as how it can enhance and support student learning. But we're also going to be looking about some of the concerns that come along with it, such as uh, student privacy, equity, and healthy development. So with all of that, we're going to try to answer how does digital technology really impact the classroom. So this is a brief outline of what we're going to go over today. So the goal of this is to address our question through multiple lenses. So we're going to start with some history, we'll look at some legal issues, st statistics, and we've integrated several activities throughout which we're going to use to look at the advantages and, and disadvantages, pros and cons. So that's how we're going to go through it. We'll finish off with a little discussion, um, talk about our conclusion. We also have a website as well. Um, so this, all this information is there. We'll give that to you at, at the end if, if you'd like. But obviously this is a massive topic. We're going to focus more on whether or not it should be integrated rather than the extent to which it should be integrated. Has, is anyone familiar with the Triple E framework? Um, essentially what it is is a way for teachers to um, look at how effective the implementation of, the technolo of technology is in their classroom. So rather than focusing on the technology itself, they're looking at the lesson goals and the way in which we're reaching those goals. So it's broken down into three E's, hence the Triple E framework. Um, so the first one is engage. It, are students be, remaining focused on task? Are they motivated to do the activity? Are they becoming involved with, different, with peers as well, right? So is there collaboration? And then it goes on to enhance and extend. So enhance is more, is it going beyond what a traditional, a traditional resource could provide them? Can, does it scaffold? Things like that, right? And then extending, can it go beyond the classroom? So is it, can they make connections to their everyday life? Things like that. So what happens is for each of these nine points, you assign it either a yes, which is equal to two points, a somewhat, which is equal to one point, or a no, which is equal to zero points. And once you add them up, um, you're going to get between zero and six, you're, ma you're meeting one of these levels, seven to 12, you're going to be meeting at least a couple, and then 13 to 18 um, is ideal, right? Because you're hitting multiple points here. Just a quick overview of that, that's going to be coming up throughout our presentation. We're going to be using that to look at some different types of technology. But to start off, so we want to get your opinion for this. What does technology mean to you? What do you think technology in the classroom is? So this kind of gives us an idea of how diverse this is, right? Because technology, in its most basic definition, is the application of um, science, right? For for purposes like this. So yeah, photocopiers, laptops, all of these can be considered technology, right? So it's it's very diverse. All right, we're going to blitz through this beautiful timeline. Whoops, too many questions. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so we're gonna focus on digital technology. And uh, so technically we could say the, like the electronic typewriter was around there, but first typewriter of uh, uh, 1915, um, typewriters became mainstream in schools. And that was one of the first times that schools started designing courses around a new technology, a new machine. Then the radio was in the 1920s and it was uh, universities used it to broadcast lessons and lectures. It was the first case of remote electronic learning, which is 
one thing we're discussing in Ontario right now quite a bit. Um, and then there's a bunch of um, audio visual enhancements, projectors, overhead projectors, television sets um, that brought the outside world into the classroom. The headphones were actually, it's so weird thinking that like there was a time before headphones because you get them for free on planes now and whatnot. But um, uh, headphones allowed for um, uh, differentiation, allowed it for individual learning in the classroom. Um, it really allowed people to focus on different things. And then the photocopier was another big advancement. It allowed uh, teachers obviously to mass produce lessons and uh, reuse things rather than having to design them every time. Uh, programming on personal computers, BASIC was the first kind of easy to learn programming language that uh, now, uh, now that kind of set the way because before it was punch cards and binary and so now it's BASIC made uh, put programming into English and was a lot easier to learn and uh, personal computers started becoming something that people were learning in university. When technology got small enough to have a computer and a mobile calculator, um, Texas Instruments made the first kind of handheld portable calculator allowing teachers to check answers and students to do calculations. Um, 1973 was when Oregon Trail came out and that is one of the first examples of digital gamification of education. Uh, next CD-ROMs we had compact storage. We, um, it was the first time that we could put like videos and, um, and sound effects on the, on the computer in, in an encyclopedia, in, in, in Carta Encyclopedia. And it replaced a lot of the paper. It started to replace a lot of the paper encyclopedias. Um, I remember fighting over in Carta Disc 2 when I was in uh, elementary school. But it was easier than waiting for three people to get through the, the book, that, the M book of the encyclopedia. Uh, smart boards were in 1991, and we're still using them now. It's the, the advancement of um, everything audio and visual with interaction. So it, it put all these streams together. Um, making a really usable uh, product. Um, and then in 2002, uh, it's kind of when the internet, um, it wasn't when the internet was invented, but when it was mainstream in education and people could do courses, could, could communicate online, could um, do, start to do courses online, uh, wireless internet brought um, learning um, out, of, out of the classroom, brought it, uh, you made it mobile. And then the 2010s, is, we see a lot more tablet computers, uh, watches, um, devices that cause controversy. Has technology gone too far? People can now cheat on their watch. People can look at their cell phone and, uh, and it's, is it a distraction? And then 2015 to now, we're getting into immersive technology. So virtual reality, um, extended reality, augmented reality, uh, things like that where we can, now it's the magic school bus. You can, you can put students in, in the bloodstream. You can look at anything. You can be on, put them on different planets. The possibilities are endless. So we're uh, got a lot of cool stuff coming up. I'm looking forward. So uh, legal issues. Gonna, the, the one thing that we wanted to mention on this is that our, it's the, the Privacy Act mm -hmm. for education has not... Just a, the Privacy the, Act in Canada, period. Our, our Privacy Act hasn't been updated since 1980. So apparently, so it needs, uh, the government needs to look at it. There's a lot of uh, issues now with facial recognition that needs to be addressed, which has some advantages in education, possibly. You could do your attendance quickly. It could alert people who are strangers on the playground. It could do a lot of things, but we need to update the laws so that we can uh, um, make a standard. And now we're gonna pass it over to me. <laughs> so here is an example of a digital field trip. Have you guys heard that term before? I've put together a bunch of examples of, of things you can do on Google and a bunch of other um, programs that I've, uh, applications I've found. I'll, I'll just let you watch it. Hello there. I'd like to show you a few things you can do with your classroom with Google Earth. Many of you may be familiar with the concept of a digital field trip. In this video, I've researched filming sites from the TV show Game of Thrones and explored them using Google Earth VR. But you don't need a virtual reality setup to do this. You can queue up any town or country that you are researching or looking at with your class, switch to satellite mode, press the 3D button, then using the keyboard and mouse, you can manipulate the image in 3D. Some more remote cities and countries have not been 3D rendered, but you can usually look at the topographical data 
Most famous historical sites have a ton of photos that previous visitors have taken that you can also explore. You can also capture your own 360 images using a cell phone or a 360 camera and place them on Google Earth. This allows you to capture the memories of the places that you've explored. Keep in mind the obvious privacy issues and blur your kids' faces. You can use Google Earth Studio to spice up your lessons with orbital views of historical sites and cities. 360 cameras have come down in price over the years. They allow you to contribute to Google Earth and capture unique perspectives. With the press of a few buttons, you can manipulate 360 images into tiny planet-styled photos. This technique allows for a very distinctive class photo. When you pair it with a protractor, it makes for a unique and personal math lesson on angles. Digital capture technology will continue to evolve during our lifetimes. Recent applications such as DisplayLand allow us to move beyond two-dimensional capture with a technique called photogrammetry. We must inspire our students to use these tools to explore the world around them. This passionate curiosity can start in our own classrooms. Thanks for watching this video. I hope you learned something new about Google Earth and digital capture technology. All right, so how do we engage student learning? So obviously, activities such as the digital field trip really increase the opportunities for learning inside of a classroom. So it is important that kids are still getting that more hands-on, where they're going out to the society and exploring and interacting with their peers. However, there's a big limit on what we can do, where we can go, and what we can show. So using digital technology gives us more opportunities to, for students to become active learners. So the use of polls, games, quizzes can create a more interactive classroom while also collecting participation and diagnostic information about the students. And using resources like smart boards, iPads, videos can really animate the classroom and keep the students more engaged during your lessons. So according to the OTF, the Ontario Teachers Federation, on their website they talked about you how using digital te technology assisted in um, learning and creating the more interactive hands-on classroom experience. So they specifically talked about how students can research different topics and then use digital technology to create different videos and websites to show what they've learned. So moving more into that, in another article called Technology in the Classroom, that author talked about the benefits of video production. So having students research a different topic and then using videos so they can make documentaries, interviews, really engages them in the material and helps them improve skills such as critical thinking, um, creativity and problem solving and which will increase their motivation to learn if they're getting more um, directing their own learning and using their creativity to show what they know. No, uh, not yet. Not yet. <laughs> um, so just on kind of the flip side of engagement even though it is true from the examples we've seen that technology can help you engage a lot of students, it can also cause some more long-term issues of attention span issues or uh, behavioral problems. So a study done in Canada in 2019 examined the relationship between uh, the use of screens and different behavioral problems like inattention and aggression. Uh, and it found that kids who use screens for more than two hours a day were five times more likely to exhibit uh, significant behavior problems compared to those who use screens for only 30 minutes or less. Uh, and additionally, they were seven times more likely to meet the criteria for attention deficit hyperactivity disorder. But the study found that kids that were as young as preschoolers were using screens for more than two hours a day already, and it only goes up as they get older. And the problems associated with screen time actually increase as well and start to lead to, to delinquency, uh, social issues, and more aggressive behavior. So to put this into the context of teaching, this has meant that the more that screens are used uh, regularly in class, the more that they have to be used. Uh, children find it a lot harder now to focus on just traditional forms of instruction, and they need this kind of um, technology all the time to stay engaged. Uh, this leaves teachers with fewer options in terms of their approach to teaching and requires them to rely on technology, even if they would rather not to, to keep their students stimulated. Technology has literally changed the landscape of a classroom with the introduction of online classrooms. Google Classroom, Papera, Class Dojo are just some examples of apps that we've seen and actually experienced in our own practicum uh, to use um, to really connect uh, the students with the teachers and the parents. Um, and uh, even in our own program, uh, we made this using a Google Docs shared the experience um, and really did a collaboration. 
So communication, so keeping parents, students, and teachers informed of what's going on inside the classroom is crucial to student success. So digital technology facilitates that collaboration between parties and ensures the communication at all times. So collaboration through communication using technology is seen in many ways in the classroom. So a couple examples, so between teachers and students, so just like Jen said, um, Google Classroom, Hapera, all those kind of resources allow the teacher to communicate with the students, share resources and collect um, an assignment and um, monitor their work habits. Um, another example is students um, working together. So collaborating using things like Google Docs and Google Slides really helps them work together on one platform to achieve a common goal and to submit an assignment or just a simple task. It also helps them with the development of collaboration skills that they'll utilize in the future that we'll talk about in a later section. Another example is teacher, teachers working together. So digital technology allows teachers to share the resources. So when they create lesson plans and unit plans, they're able to share it with one another and um, adapt on that and build to build a better education for our students. Another example is teachers and parents. So teachers can use uh, websites, social media, such as Twitter, Instagram, to communicate with parents and let them know what's going on inside the classroom at all times. It also allows teachers to share resources that they're using so that the parents can help their students outside of the classroom as well. And it just keeps them in the loop at all times. So another issue we wanted to highlight with, yeah, when talking about these activities is the issue of accessibility. So even though having activities like this, as we talked about, can be really engaging for students, not every school or every classroom is going to have access to them. So uh, video and 360 tours, like the one that Dean demonstrated, require faster internet to load larger file sizes, which is something that is not as available in more remote rural or indigenous communities. So if you look at some places like Yukon, <laughs> okay. Well, anyways, it was a map. Um, if we give you the link, you can probably look at this website later, but it does show areas that don't have uh, internet connection or ha don't have reliable connection. And even though in Canada, 96% of Canadians do have access in 2015, that number drops to about 79% for Canadians living in the north. And additionally, Statistics Canada reported that 42% of low-income households lack internet access at home. So this can make it difficult for students to uh, complete homework that requires access to internet, which is becoming increasingly the case. So while some teachers have been able to use all of these tools to revolutionize their classrooms, other schools or other students have been left behind. Now we're just gonna, we're gonna look at some uh, statistics surrounding digital technology being used uh, specifically by youth and as well as digital technology in the classroom. So to start this off, we're gonna look at this quote here. And it says that three quarters of Canadian parents are concerned about how much time children spend using media, reporting that 36% of their 10 to 13 year olds spend three hours or more per day using digital devices for reasons unrelated to schoolwork. So there's two things uh, that we can take away from this. The first is that of course this is unrelated to schoolwork, so it's not including time that they're spending using it for homework or in the classroom as well. And the second thing that I think is also very important is that these are the parents who are reporting this. I know that when I was 10 to 13 years old, my parents didn't know how much time I was spending on my Game Boy. <laughs> so going forward here, we're just gonna be looking at how kids use digital technology in general. 24% of Canadian students in grade four, 52 in grade seven, 85 in grade 11 have their own cell phone. So as we can see, as they get older, they're more likely to have their own cell phone. And another thing that I want to point out is that this was done in a survey that was published in 2014. So these numbers might even be higher now. Around a third of Canadian students between grade four and 11 use the internet to post creative things online. So this is things such as videos, art, et cetera. So um, basically they're, they're using it as a creative outlet. And this is something that could possibly be harnessed in the classroom. 78% of Canadian students between grade four and 11 use the internet as a source for news, health issues, and relationships. So they're going there for information. Um, whether this information is valid or not, that's another question, but this is how they use the internet. Um, and then my favorite, 30% of Canadian students between grade four and six have a Facebook account and 16 have a Twitter account, despite the website's regulations regarding users being 13 years or older. Most students between grade four and six are not. Years or older. All right. 
Um, so now looking specifically in education here, uh, this here is a graph that looks at e-learning over the past decade or so. Uh, and as we can see in 2019, we have had the largest population of Ontario students specifically enrolled in e-learning. So e-learning can be beneficial, um, specifically for students who might live in remote locations where access to courses in traditional classroom settings is not available. Where it can sort of become a burden is when students are taking e-learning courses despite there being available uh, classroom settings for these courses or if they're being forced to, of course, as well. Bring your own device, BYOD. Uh, we can see that secondary schools, which is the lighter color here, um, around two-thirds of them in Ontario say to always bring your own device. Uh, whereas in elementary schools, there's more of a indeterminate. So, like, there's still a lot of them saying always, but then there's also a lot of them saying never as well. One thing that I wanted to point out about this um, was that I remember when I was in grade nine and I, our, our school got a whole bunch of TI Inspires, which are the fancy graphing calculators. Uh, I looked it up before doing this presentation and they're like $200. Uh, last year, I went into my old high school to volunteer and in the classroom, there were the TI Inspires, but no one uses them anymore. Kids just pull out their phone and they use Desmos, which is a graphing calculator app. Cell phones in the classroom. We can see that for elementary schools, uh, the policies are specifically being made at the school level, for the majority anyway, for two thirds. For secondary schools, it's sort of flipped where teachers are making the policy. And now just some points on the teacher's perspective. So 79% of Canadian teachers agree that network devices make student learning more achievable, and 74% of teachers believe that these devices help them meet some students' learning needs. So this could be diagnosed IEPs or any other learning needs that the teacher might be observing where some sort of technical uh, technology can help this student learn. 97% of teachers said that their schools provide them with at least one type of network device, so laptops, Chromebooks, tablets, etc as long as it can connect to the internet. The main concern though for teachers was that technical support for maintaining upgrading technology was not always available, especially for schools in remote locations. So the technology was there, it's just they might not have had uh, the resources to use it most efficiently. And this second point here sort of goes along with that. And that's the second main concern was that teachers are not always given proper training to, for devices to meet curricular goals. So I think a great example of this is the video that we watched of Dean, where there's a whole bunch of stuff there that is available to pretty much anyone who has a computer, right? But I didn't know that you could do that. <laughs> and I bet there's a lot of teachers out there who don't know that. And so this is because I think that the resources aren't always there to help teachers find this. And also it is sort of on the teachers as well to go out and look for these resources to help you better understand how to use the technology that you have at your disposal. So we've looked at how technology kind of helps all students, but it especially helps open doors for students with exceptionalities. So it makes um, the classroom, uh, increases the equity in the classroom. So a really great example is of course, assistive read and write, I'm an example of assistive technology. Due to time, I will not demo because sometimes it doesn't work quite what you'd expect, um, which kind of highlights the point that as teachers, we're not always given the training to use the, this tool that students need. And this enhances student learning um, following the triple E pattern, um, sorry, triple E model. Um, it's really important that it gives each student that individual um, experience that they need. <laughs> There's something interesting going on. House hippos have returned to Canadian homes, but they're extremely hard to spot. They enjoy admiring their reflections, hoarding socks, helping themselves to your devices, and annoying your pets. It looks like Canada has a house hippo problem. Or do we?
We brought back the house hippo to show how easy it is to be fooled in our digital world. Find out how to tell what's real and what's not at breakthefake.ca. So had we all seen that commercial before? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. So we wanted to bring this up just to highlight the fact that uh, the issue of misinformation isn't really new, but it didn't have a name before. But now with new um, social media networks and data privacy issues, it's become more and more relevant. As a result, many people have become worried about the overwhelming role that technology can play in our lives. And as we've seen, students are using it to find information online, but they might not have the know-how to know if what they're finding is really true or not. And as a result, our education system has already adjusted to include things like uh, media literacy and things like that in the curriculum, which is great. And there are a number of resources that we've highlighted on our webpage that can be used. These will only become more necessary with time. And as you noted before, the legal aspect hasn't adjusted either to reflect that, so changes still need to be made. And in order to bring up a new generation of students that are savvy and understand both the benefits and the drawbacks of having a presence online, it's really the role of teachers to be sure that they're including this in their classrooms. And so extending students' learning, so we're not only preparing them for a world of digital um, or media literacy skills, we also need to prepare them as digital citizens. So according to Keith Ulrich, which is the CEO of um, like a technology company called learning.com, he wrote that approximately 80% of students will need to use some form of media technology in their future careers. So whether it be Microsoft skills, research skills, or simply just keyboard, learning how to use a computer, it's really important that we're introducing students to these skills at an earlier age so that they have time to develop and learn these skills that will help them um, succeed in the future. So in addition, when students are using technology for their assignments, so if they're learning making videos or playing these games, they're also learning about ethical practices, so like copyright laws, and they're also learning how to safely and properly use the internet through um, learning from teachers and educators in a more safe environment. So do we have any brave souls that would like to do a quick typing activity for us? No. Okay. Thank you for volunteering. Okay. I think it's that last one. Yeah. Oh no, this looks complex. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So um, essentially, it's kind of a race that you can oh, wow. do between students. Oh, I'm impressed. Pretty <laughs> good. So you see at the bottom. So it's going to show your words per minute in the top right there, and you can kind of make it a little competition between your students as well if you'd like to help them learn to type. So this is just one example of, of the technology that you can use for typing. Okay, now we want to get uh, your opinion again. Do you think something like NitroType is enhancing it? Um, students' education, engaging students' education, extending based on the triple E model, or is it distracting? Well, actually, <laughs> I don't want to distract students. Yeah, well, <laughs> let's, 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 yeah, let's have a discussion around yeah. this because it is kind of this is the gray area of technology in the classroom. Where does it go from learning and gaming to like intrinsic learning versus trying to get the reward? So, what do you guys think? Why did you vote yes or no? Yeah. 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 <laughs> First. Um, I should say uh, it depends on the teacher and the students. Mm -hmm. uh, for example, uh, we, we need to cons uh, consider the uh, disabilities of the students and their mm -hmm. needs and their like uh, their special needs. And also it depends on the teacher if it's not very comfortable or uh, he, he might be a novice teacher, he doesn't have a learning goal in his mind, he just mm -hmm. use it for fun, mm -hmm. definitely is not good for the objectives, but uh, for an experienced teacher who are good at those things and he knows how to integrate those in, mm -hmm. in the classroom, of course, that works. So that's <laughs> what I'm <laughs> saying. Yeah, absolutely. What I thought of it is I used to teach swimming, um, and the kids would always be upset that all the other swimming instructors would do like races and stuff. But I would never let them do that because when they were racing, their strokes were bad and they were just like, they were, like, they were just playing all over the place. So it wasn't helping them at all. Like, I'm sure it was fun, but it didn't add anything to what they were learning. So we used to do races, but it was like, I would just call them like finesse races, where if they didn't do well, they would start again. So <laughs> it wasn't a speed thing. It was like whoever has the nicest front crawl and then you can go. So 
you know, that was what was helping their learning and making them work as a team because they didn't want to have to fail. But um, yeah, the, the just initial like race part or game part wasn't really helping them. Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Does anyone else have anything else they want to? Well, I think there needs to be some, some teaching. You mentioned learning goals, mm -hmm. but it has to be, when you use this as an activity that are kind of independent practice, there is a learning goal that's set. There needs to be some kind of teaching and guided learning before you say, okay, go practice. Just mm -hmm. like teaching, mm -hmm. you can't say, okay, we're gonna learn how to type. You have to teach about what the keyboard is like and how to type. And this could be a way to enhance or extend learning by practice, but it's missing the whole other part of teaching. It's, yeah. You can't just say, go play a game. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I think that's that sums up what we're what we're, we're looking at per perfectly. Everything needs to have a purpose behind it, right? Like you said, we can't just throw students into something and say do it. They need to understand why they're doing it, and we need to make sure that it's it's right for students, right? Because this, like we talked about, this isn't going to work for every student. So again, for the purpose of time, I won't go through every single point. But in terms of engaging, does the technology allow students to focus on task? Somewhat depends on the student. So we decide that a one. Does the technology motivate students in the learning process? Again, somewhat, one, depends on the student. Um, and then does technology cause a shift in the behavior uh, when they move from passive to active learners? So are they interacting with others? Somewhat, one, right? So that section would have a three. Um, you can do the other ones, and that would be how you would use this model. But, okay. okay, so I'm sure for the last 10, I think I've heard it for the last 10 years, is we gotta teach kids to program. We gotta teach kids to program. It's a very good mindset to understand how a computer works, and we're, we're doing it in our daily lives now with, uh, uh, no one's got one, but Googles and Alexas and all those, you know, <laughs> might have queued your uh, things there. But we can't control really what kids are playing at home, but there are some games that we could possibly recommend better uses of. Um, so does anyone, do you guys have like coding clubs at your schools? No? We had, there was like a, I think it's like Canada Codes or Canada, yeah. that's what they were called. Yeah. They came in and they would do like regular sessions. Yeah, that's like great. Every other week with the same class, but it was nothing like there's all these educational licenses for things you can get uh, mostly Minecraft and then uh, the other the, the big one they probably thought was scratch scratch, scratch. Yes, yes, yes. yeah so scratch is fantastic <laughs> I wish I had that when I was a kid um, does anyone recognize this top left one you know what that font no oh, that's Fortnite Fortnite the next one's Roblox one of my grade fives asked me to buy him Robux which is the digital currency that they He's like, can it's you buy me those? But it's real money. I know. Yeah. I know. So that, that's the that's the that's the yeah. iffy part, right? Because yeah. these games kind of prey on our kids' time and uh, parents' resources, money. Yeah. But but they also have some features that um, allow for great creativity and inspire programming. So Minecraft doesn't have microtransactions, so it's a little bit better. But it also doesn't have the scripting that these other two have. So Fortnite, you can you can make an object and you can move around furniture and then you can queue things up to um, to create your own uh, experiences, games and stories. Roblox is the closest thing out of the three of them to professional languages such as uh, Unity and Unreal. Game developers use a an IDE, a system like this, where they um, drag in a tree and then they click that tree and say, when a player is in a radius of the tree, play Jingle Bells, things like that. Minecraft. That is a someone's wired up a computer with, a, and it, so it kind of teaches like electricity. But we have to encourage that they're they're using the, that they're playing these like games in that style. Um, in but at least these kind of games at home can inspire um, learning and uh, towards programming. Here's a little scratch video, but we've all seen scratch, 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 scratch. We've all seen scratch. Okay, scratch is great because it makes programming like Lego, and it's, <laughs> it's not scary. And it, it's not just games, it's animations, you can do presentations in it. So, wonderful. Okay, so really quickly, um, kind of just to summarize our, our presentation. Um, so we kind of crafted this uh, presentation, not only to talk about how technology is used, but also demonstrating. We used polls. We had, if we had time, we would have seen the assistive technology, kind of just to um, demonstrate what you can do, the amazing things you can do with technology. Um, however, it also kind of highlighted some of the pitfalls. We had a website that didn't work. Last time we did this presentation, Google Read and Write decided to not quite um, respond immediately. Uh, and so it's kind of this um, challenge that we all face as teachers. 
Um, and it's a very nuanced issue. What we think, kind of just to quickly summarize. So as a group, we believe that technology is a powerful educational tool that has to be, sorry, yes, <laughs> that has to be in today's classroom. It's unavoidable, it has to be there. Um, and it's just an amazing opportunity for the students that we should use and should implement. Um, however, there is the importance that is detrimental if not used correctly. As we discussed, it's important that there is a teacher there, that um, technology cannot replace good teaching. And using a triple E model or something similar, make sure that the technology is actually supportive to learning. This is our website um, that we created. So yeah, this is a, a summary of our all our information as well as the references. Uh, we just want to say thank you so much for listening. Thank you for your comments. Thank you so much.